So as people are trickling in, um, thanks everyone for joining us. I'm going to thank our sponsors very quickly. If uh, Anissa, you wouldn't mind throwing up the, the slide. Um, so men's services, Syntex, Sash and Door and Night Construction. Uh, a generous thank you to all three of these companies here in Austin that uh, provide various services in the um, construction uh, and architectural industry here in Austin. We're very thankful for their generous support this year uh, of the Small Firms Roundtable Committee. And uh, if anyone from any of those organization, organizations is joining us today, thank you uh, so much for your support. It, it means a lot to uh, not only our committee, but, but AIA Austin uh, in general and uh, helps us bring great programming to our constituents. So with that, I would like to uh, welcome Lori Riker from the great state of Montana right now. Um, yeah, thanks for joining us. Thanks for taking time out of your schedule. And um, she, uh, I, I, met, I met Lori in, in college. She was one of my professors. She was my thesis advisor. Um, and I've been kind of keeping up with her uh, you know, more through social media, I suppose, and occasional emails and even maybe an occasional lunch when she's here in Austin sometimes, which I think she finds herself in, uh, you know, from time to time. Uh, but Lori is a very accomplished woman in a lot of different fields of uh, sort of probably radiating from the practice of architecture, but uh, she uh, obviously is an educator she is a writer. She has uh, books that she has uh, published and, and worked with people to publish. Um, she is an artist. Uh, the, the painting that I posted as part of the uh, invitation to this round table was, was one of hers. Um, and she also started a nonprofit organization called the Artemis Institute, which is really about, and I'll let her, I don't wanna put words in her mouth about her organization, but it's, it's basically kind of this, immersive program in a very specific geographical location being in the Paradise Valley of Montana, where she works with students and artists and um, you know, other professionals potentially in the capacity of a residency to kind of immerse themselves in, the, uh, in that environment and uh, think about the relationship between um, culture and nature through perhaps the vehicle of, of architecture or art. Um, so a, a, a vast array of, of, of many hats that she uh, is wearing and, and currently, as I understand, sort of managing the construction of her own personal residence right now. Um, as I so, need one more thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Sounds like it. That was such a short list, Lori. Um, so anyway, I, uh, you know, um, I believe, you know, again, without putting words in her mouth, I think she's probably had a somewhat unconventional um, career. And uh, in, in that way, I think she is a very interesting person to speak with about kind of her origins, her path to where she is today. Um, so Lori, thank you again for being here. Thanks for taking time out of your schedule. Um, let's just start with uh, kind of maybe some softball questions, but when and, and, and why did you decide to, to join the field of architecture to become an architect? Um, well, I was young when I made that decision. I don't know if I would make it again <laughs> <laughs> as a grown up. Um, but I always, I mean, I, I drew a lot when I was a kid and um, most of you guys probably don't know, but I grew up in Texas. And when I was um, about 12, we relocated from Houston proper to the Woodlands. And most of you probably have heard of the Woodlands, um, but it was a large development, but hardly any, any of the development had started at that point. And so anyways, I was surrounded by a lot of natural environment and the homes that were going in are what we might call more contemporary in nature. And so that was really interesting. I spent a lot of time as a little kid, like riding my bike down the street and find a house under construction and roam around in it. Um, and I, I didn't realize until much later that um, 
Halpern was one of the big designers uh, for kind of the land planning of that, which, uh, so the, basically the same minds that thought about Sea Ranch in California also thought about the woodlands. And I uh, have experienced both over my life, so I can, I understand that relationship. Anyhow, so in thinking about, in a little kid's mind, everybody tells you, you don't make any money from art. Well, I was like, well, okay, I'll be an architect then. And I took drafting in high school. That's when everybody was still drawing with pencils and uh, parallel bars. And because the Woodlands was growing, I started working in firms when I was like 16. So I've had a long, a long career in that way. Great. Um, so I guess, what, 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 I guess in what capacity did you, did you start working? Were you, were you, were you drafting at that time and taking mm -hmm. direction from the principals? Yeah, and creating yeah. I, was, I was drafting uh, because I had those skills sure. and um, I had a two, I can't remember. Well, I think I had a job in Houston early or than the one in the woodlands where it was that typical where, you, you know, they were still making blueprints. Right. And I can remember like, <laughs> being you know the person in the basement making the blueprints <laughs> because nothing it you know we have a completely different system now um and i think eventually they let me start um picking up with it you know i'm sure you guys still all call it this markups and um so by the time i got to the one in the woodlands that was residential design and the architect was just a really, I can't remember his name, but he was a really sweet guy and I think creative and thoughtful. And, um, you know, so I, because he was a nice human, I wasn't just drawing, he'd say, well, what do you think about this? You know, or, so I think he did a, a good job of mentoring a really young person. Um, and I still, even at that point, didn't see any of the maybe not so fun stuff that we spend so much of our life dealing with. Sure, sure. From there, you went to Texas A&M. I, I did. Guess. And at that point, mm -hmm. you knew you were going to get a degree in architecture. Yeah, it was actually a Bachelor of Environmental Design. And at that point, it was um, very closely based on the Berkeley program, which, you know, they still have that undergraduate degree, the Bachelor of Environmental Design. So it was it was meant to be like as liberal arts oriented you could get an architecture program. Uh, so the people that taught me, and I think this still happens maybe in architecture school, although accreditation really seems to have a stronghold on uh, ramming what we should be doing as architects um, down everybody's throat. And, but it, so I was taught by sculptors and philosophers and um, painters early on, and then, you know, going up through the program, then moved into more traditional architecture. So I say that because it, it all seemed very, um, so free and open of what architecture might be and where you might fit in it. Um, so that was, it was a really great experience for me. That's great. And then on to Harvard for graduate school. After right. After a right. and Yep. Got the master's was, architecture there. How, how was that? Who, who, did you, who did you come across there, I guess, in terms of, uh, obviously, it's got a storied history of incredible. Um, right, right. Well, so when I came into the program, Rafael Mineo was the director. Okay. And I still can't imagine a better director. I don't think I've, as I've been paying attention, who's been the director's there would have never been a better director than that for me. He's just an amazing, I mean, he thinks like a poet and architecture is um, a huge responsibility to society and culture and experience. Um, and he, because he, um, because of his ties, we had some, you know, great Spanish, South American and, European architects come through that we would have wouldn't have ever had, you know, um, the opportunity to experience. And um, so he started, and then when I got into the advanced studios, um, I you know it's 
I think this happens with most graduate level where you get different professors from different um, places. And so that was also um, really great. Max Goggin taught me um, in one of those advanced studios. And then I think the last year that I was there, uh, Mineo's position was finished and Max Goggin came in. And that was just fun for me because I already had a, a good rapport. So I didn't have to like meet somebody when I was finishing up my thesis who didn't know who I was. Um, although Raphael, I remember was there for my thesis review. So I might have the dates a little bit, a little bit off, but. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, it sounds like, I mean, is it fair to say that Mineo ha ha has a lasting effect on even the way you think today? Oh, of uh, course. I mean, you yes. talked about culture there, which I know is obviously an important component of, of your explorations with the Artemis Institute. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like he had a very, uh, or a significant um, place in your life. He did. And, and I think that, um, I was thinking about this recently, what the young young students and graduates are faced with versus what I was faced with at the time because you know the word sustainability didn't even exist and if we were talking about something being green it still was back in the 70s as a concept back then it hadn't been really brought forward and so the the wonderful thing about the the thinkers at that time is that they were still really immersed in the belief that architecture had a responsibility to poetry. You know, that there was this poetic. And so it wasn't all technology. It wasn't industry. You know, it, you weren't, it, it wasn't this kind of um, world fixing machine that we're seeing it, it evolve into right now. And, and that's not to see that I, that I think that that's bad. It's just that I worry that we that we might lose that value of poetics, and I think that um, we have to be doing both at the same time. And I'm not sure if that's being carried forward right now in schools as much. Uh, so, so yeah, there's. I mean, it obviously made a huge impression on me. Um, it's interesting though because my interests in environment um, and what we might call sustainability were already there. And I, I think it's just because I've been across the country a couple of times and seen places that have been ravaged. And, um, and I also was a child of those, you know, those seventies, I remember, you know, having lunch boxes and folders and things at school that had like the big ecology logo on it, you know, and pictures of like pristine mountains and things. Um, but so my thesis actually dealt with, with a big portion of that. And I didn't quite realize it um, until one of the landscape architecture professors pointed out to me, she said, well, you realize that all the sites you've selected, because I, I did three different projects for my thesis, three different designs. Um, she said, they're all in disturbed landscapes. And so that was, that was a real eye opener for me. And how did you view them before she pointed that out to you? Or what, what, like, what was your take on those sites before she brought that to your attention? Um, well, I knew that they all had issues or, or conditions that were really, um, and, the, and it, that were unique, but I hadn't tied it all together because it's not that they were all destructed. One of them was outside of Boston and that was the one that had the biggest human impact of destruction and pollution. Um, I didn't know it at the time. And there was one on the West Coast, north of um, California and it was a big part of the of highway one out on the coast and an earthquake basically had like knocked off part of the like disconnected kind of a little outcropping that the highway went around and then they just abandoned it. Um, and then the other one went, was in the Badlands, which has a lot of erosion and, um, and then kind of maybe misuse in some ways. And so I was looking at them specifically as unique landscapes. And then, but, but as I started to deal with them and the responses, it was more like, how do you deal with this problem or this destruction, the pollution, 
in the in the Boston area, the kind of leftover <laughs> road conditions. They just put like a cyclone fence around, and um, so so you know, really strong responses to landscapes. I'd kind of I'd like to maybe go back to what you said about poetics in architecture. Maybe unpack that a little bit. Um, I know I remember from my education with you. You know, there was uh, that was probably my my introduction to this idea of uh, phenomenological mm -hmm. architecture in space. Uh, Gaston Bachelard was was someone that you you know recommended. Uh, Heidegger was uh, another um, author that we we read. And you know, I tend to agree with you that that the the, the poetics of architecture does seem to be suffering at, at the behest of other things that have sort of come up as, as seemingly more important to try to achieve. Um, but I, I guess I'm curious if you if you are or what what architects or or even artists we don't have to like limit this to architecture um, mm -hmm. but what people are are creating things in a way that you feel is is holding on to that to that idea of, of poetic um, space making or form making um well i think you know he's not practicing so much anymore but Merkit, glenn Merkit, obviously um and i think that um, I'm since you kind of caught me off guard and it's not some somebody that I wasn't thinking about this so much. Um, actually, I think Kundig does a great job. Okay. You know, wait, everybody's familiar with his work. Sure. Um, I think he's overused the gizmo um, okay. <laughs> a little bit too much, but I think that that, that is this catch 22 because when you um, make something that people can recognize like that and it's really cool because it is. And in the first, Bit that he did like that with moving walls that were moved by hand, which is what I love so much about it. Um, but then anybody who's got great wealth, they want one of those too. It's just like everybody wanting a Ferrari if you can afford it. Got it. Um, so anyways, but regardless of that, I think that he has a, he and everybody who works under him, because it's a large firm now, um, but they have a great thoughtfulness you know, about how do you experience this, the building and the place and how does the experience of being in the building in relationship to light and texture actually move you forward, uh, you know, in the world in maybe profound ways that you don't realize at the beginning. Um, and I think the same thing can be said of Merkit, you know, whether or not he is um, thinking about one of his homes in the outback and the fact that you don't get rain very often, but when you do, um, how do you, you know, people use words like celebrate. I hate that, but <laughs> I get it. Um, it's just, it becomes overused, right? But how do you t help a phenomenon like you're, you were talking about, i.e. rain, for instance, be an experience that connects us to the world and kind of brings us back to the place and understanding while there either hasn't been a rain in a long time, or it could be when it does rain, um, what does it do to this landscape because of how the architect has designed the building that allows um, that landscape to flourish in a certain way. Okay. Um, so that that's what I'm thinking about. And it's, you know, when I talk about the kind of um, pressure of, technologies that, and the, <laughs> the, the things that people are trying to solve right now, it is not to disparage that at all. Oh my sure. God, there's so, it's so absolutely important. Um, but I think that as we are gaining a better handle on how to solve that, that it doesn't just become, oh, I know how to solve that. Cause the technologies are complicated. Right. I mean, I don't even get into that really, really in my work, but when I, even when I'm, because I am dealing with houses, but when you think about, you know, larger building envelopes and things like that, and once you get that solution, I think it can become very easy to just say, we did that wall system, we can do that again, um, instead of saying, how does it lend itself to this particular place, environment, the people that are going to be in it, um, and I think that again, Merkit and, and Kundig both, like 
this idea of doing things by hand, that a window doesn't automatically open and vent. Um, I understand that we need to think about things like that automatically in large buildings because we're trying to uh, design to a certain load that then reduces energy. But at the same time, if we don't have some of those small moves that people need to uh, be confronted with, we forget again. So whether it's rainfall or whether it's a house is um, designed more or less to be passive and how it works is you remembering to open the windows or open a vent or close or bring down a blind or something. I know that that seems tedious to people, but that's really, um, that's part of being on the planet. Yeah. That, that's interesting. I mean, it's the tactile relationship or the interaction with the space, which may, may, may not have been what I was thinking. I think when you said that in terms mm. of, you know, maybe I, maybe I think of just kind of the more of an ando concrete box with one light slit and the whole dynamic space is, you know, there's nothing in there except the sunlight moving across a wall. In the poetic way. aspect. In the poetic aspect, yes, oh, yeah, but yeah. not, because when I think about Kundig's work, I think, wow, there's kind of a lot going on, right? And there's, <laughs> well, we mentioned texture, which I mean, if I heard him say, oh, this, I'm doing this because it creates texture, uh, that 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 would resonate with me, I guess. But But yeah, certainly the kind of, interaction with his structures is, is I mean I've never I've never been in one of his structures but it has right. to be quite quite different than than kind of a typical um a, ty a typical home sure or sure I, I think you know so obviously I'm going to speak about the ones that resonate with me right that I'm thinking sure. about sure. and I certainly looked at Ando's work when I was younger and I get that poetic and it's not to say that he also isn't um, aspiring, you know, and has achieved this kind of like amazing kind of drama um, in, in that way. You know, we could look at um, like Abusier's Ranchamp, and that also has an amazing poetic to it. It's tied um, again specifically to the place because he was thinking about different windows and colors and light as they come through, but he was also thinking about the mythology of the church, you know, and how do you bring those two together? And then how does that really um, tell a story about who we are, but not just a story that's distant, one that we experience when we, when we go into it. Um, I think that um, Rick Joy's early work, it, it's not as austere as Ando, but these kind of more um, like monolithic pieces of the rammed earth and the concrete. Um, again, they're smaller because they were homes. Um, so it's kind of a different scale. But I think again, there's this, there's an interest there with how do you interact with that place and, and not just the, the immediate place, but the more universal aspects of it. And um, how do you make a place for somebody? Because it was a, a, they are homes of respite, you know? And even in, even that, and in, in the sense of like understanding what the thing is that you're designing for, um, I think should have a poetic interpretation, right? Is it a, is it a public building or, or is it a private building? Is it a refuge? Is it, um, is it an event hall? You know, so if you were to look at say Hans Schroon's um, Philharmonic in Berlin, um, an amazing, amazing building. And he had this, it's a beautiful place to, to listen to music. Um, but he was also very concerned at the time with the idea of democracy. And it's one of the reasons there's no hierarchy of sitting in that place. Now that's both a political um, issue, but it also is a poet, he dealt with it poetically. So it's not like hitting you over the head with something, sure. um, but, but just like, and at the same time, because of how he designed uh, the, the sound of it, everybody has equal experience to the music, no matter where they're sitting. To me, that is both, like I said, is political and poetic. Yeah, that's a very interesting and poignant example, I think, of of that idea. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on the spot for sure uh, now. <laughs> um, so, what, can you can you describe maybe some of the the poetry that you were 
that you have instilled into your current project and your current, I guess, future. Oh, my, the home. house, the yeah. house. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, so I can talk about a couple of things. And of course, without seeing it, you guys are just going to have to like imagine, right? So yeah. the, the house is built in a landscape that hasn't been built on before. So it, it's, um, and it's in the forest. It's up against, not, not immediately, but it has in view the Absorca Mountains, so a big mountain range. And uh, it's a small house. It's just 1,500 square feet. Um, but there were several things that I was concerned or thinking about. And one of them is, how do you... I wanted to make a house that disappeared. Um, you know, obviously there's always this moment, which I'm dealing with right now, where I only had to take down one tree. Um, and that's also something that's always critical for me because I deal with these big open landscapes is don't put your house in the place in the best place, put it next to the best place, put it in the place that needs to be um, kind of built back or, or kind of re-envisioned. Um, so anyways, the it backs up against the forest and you know i was dealing with budget i'm dealing with the fact that we all know the planet is warming we know that um things are very expensive right now and kind of durability issues and so i used a, a material that lots of people are using um which is just corrugated metal and in one of its standard dark gray colors yeah. And again, that maybe the treatment of it is not that unusual. It was when I started working this way 20 years ago, you know, and looking at details. But the whole thing, short of a few details, is all that metal, roof sides and everything. But in choosing the, the dark gray, I think that it will become like a, a shadowy figure. Sure as the landscape comes, comes in. And so in a way that is this kind of mirage. Um, it's also a single pitch. So, you know, high to low. And, um, and because we don't get a lot of moisture, you know, as you know, we do get snow, although not as much anymore. Yeah. But with a single pitch, it allows the drama of the moisture as it's coming off the roof um, on the overhang side to just kind of drip down into the woods. Um, so in thinking about, you know, that just those two sorts of things. Um, and it has not like a killer million dollar view or $10 million view, which I know you know what I'm talking about, but there's still a, a view back at the mountains and it, it does have that it has a, a large window assemblage that looks that way. But I think that um, I was on the land for two years before I, you know, I started building. This, the general site was obvious to me, again, because I was looking at, well, there's no trees here. There's a view that direction that opens up through the woods. So it's kind of obvious um, that it's there. But what's so amazing to me about the view is that it's not the big Western sunset view. Instead, it gets the alpine glow and the, the mountain that it's looking at has already gone through forest, so it's a uh, forest fire. So it's got a, a lot of standing dead, but it, it really becomes this, it is, it is the kind of um, weather vein of phenomena of the place. Okay. Um, as you're looking through it. So it's not a, it's not the big picture window painting that you get of like, ah, the perfect mountain scene. Um, but it is, it is more this kind of um, window view that you might think of in, uh, it, it doesn't look like Terrell, but in that sense of the light changing and how does that then affect the inside space because you have this um, this kind of light glow that might be coming in or reflecting back into the house. The house itself inside is very simple. It's white, it's concrete. It's very similar to the palette I see that you use. Um, 
And again, that was more about like letting the, um, the colors from the outside come in. I was laying tile in the, in my bathroom last weekend and it was, it's very green on the opposite side of this kind of mountain view because it looks into the woods. And I was like looking at the wall opposite of the window that looks onto the woods and it, the room was green. And I was just like, yeah, yeah, that's working. That's cool. You know, yeah, it was, it's, so it's just those stop you in your track moments um, that, that, you know, you hope that you're anticipating, but you can't completely know until sure. it all happens. Well, and it kind of, I mean, I, I haven't, I haven't done a deep dive on, on all of your paintings, but you were just, uh, as you're talking about kind of this view into your environment, not being, you know, this quote unquote sort of majestic, uh, you know, capturing the landscape, but more sort of bringing the landscape closer to you. I, I've noticed that a lot of your paintings reflect that same sort of tightness of environment, um, that it's almost like the immediate it's the immediate that I'm painting. I'm not, you know, it, it doesn't seem right. vast in terms of, I mean, obviously you live in a vast, in a very vast landscape and to kind of, you know, um, condition your experience to be something that's more immediate. And I think probably the Artemis Institute does a, a great job of, of kind of bringing you into this kind of microcosm of the larger environment. Um, so, uh, you know, you talking about your architecture, uh, sort of just the immediate relationship to, to, to the environment, I think is, is quite, quite interesting and, and quite poetic in and of itself. Um, well, I guess, so let's, let's maybe talk a little bit about um, kind of your firm experience, you know, obviously you've, you've, I think you're maybe in your second iteration of a, of a practice or of a firm. Um, when, when did you kind of leave the office and, and strike out uh, on your own, on your own path, I guess, to, to, um, you know, create, create your own projects? Uh, well, I, I think that in some ways I had a pretty, uh, traditional kind of track out, but um, the uh, I also I mean I've survived three recessions, and when I right when I graduated from uh, Harvard, we went through one of our first ones in the early '90s, and um, so you know I thought oh this is going to be great I'm going to go work for a really great architect and like you know, learn all this great architecture stuff, even though I'd already been practicing, but, um, you know, I thought this would be the time, you know, to be able to do that. And nobody had any work. I mean, people were changing professions, which I don't know if any of you guys experience this, but there is not a huge amount of my era in the professional world because so many of them had to go get other jobs and they never went back. Hmm. Um, but, I, I was lucky enough and I got a job in New York City after, after uh, graduate school. And I was working there and enjoyed the work. And one of the partners was horrible, just not a nice human being. Mm. And so I'd already, um, I kind of made the decision that like, if I was gonna leave New York, that was gonna be a you know, for good, because it's not easy to get there. It's very expensive to stay. And also I learned very hard to like physically get yourself out of if you've got any kind of stuff. Um, and I had always thought that I would teach when I got older, but instead I was like, well, they're teaching positions. Let's see how far West I can get. <laughs> Cause I, I thought, you know, I'd fallen in love with Montana just driving through it. Okay. Um, and so I looked at what was available and there weren't a lot because I had thought, had my epiphany so late in the, in the season of getting hired for academia. And I ended up getting a, a job um, at North Dakota State University. And it was one of the best years for me teaching ever. The students were awesome. 
Um, but because it was so cold there, I spent a lot of time reading and researching. So anyways, to get, to get back to that. So I've been in and out academia and practice. And I'd always in my mind thought I would be doing both somehow in a tandem relationship. Um, but didn't really start my practice in a really like clear way till I got to Montana. And so, so I went, I'd been practicing, I went and got a PhD. Then I came to, to MSU um, and at, within like, I think a year. And it was very, it was typical, you know, the, you meet a builder, they need some help. Um, then they actually land like the giant project <laughs> and they're like, now I really need help. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of how it started for me, but I always, I, you can probably tell just from listening to me talk. I look through everything with this academic lens. You know, you mentioned something at the very beginning of like success and success, you know, talking to people who've had success and I, I think that that's a, it depends on what your measure is, right? I can't say I've had financial success. Um, I could have, and I could even now with the projects that I get, but I don't, I don't, I deal with them pretty much like I would have, that I taught you in school. It's very, in that way, it's like design is important and it's critical and you have to get it right. Um, presenting well to your clients um, in a way that helps evoke kind of this poetic that we were talking about is important. Um, I still build physical models. I build physical models, cool. uh, both in studying and for the final for the presentation. I, I have yet to have a client who didn't, who's not said this was so helpful. Um, or this is awesome, I really understand. And that's in addition to computer renderings or you know whatever else. The sure. model hands down speaks volumes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. agreed. So, and so you're having those open conversations with your clients. I mean, it, it, if you go back to sort of, so it sounds like at the beginning of your practice, you were getting work from builders, mm -hmm. which May not. I mean, maybe there were some very special builders that were talking to you about poetics at that time, but pro probably not would be my guess. So, you know, kind of going from sort of working in, in, in maybe non-poetic architecture and just, okay, here's the program, here's the site, this is what we need to do, here's the budget, et cetera. Of course, you're going to be creative within yourself when you're, you know, addressing that and coming up with the design. But um, now it sounds like you can have these more kind of phenomenological conversations with your clients and, and they enjoy that and they understand it and they, they want to experience these, these sort of intangible qualities that you know that you can bring to the table if you're allowed to kind of do, do that, I guess, with, right. with their project and spend, spend their money do, doing it. Um, so, I, I, you know, what what... Can you just talk a little bit about how that, I mean, is that kind of conversation number one? Hey, I, or how do you, how do you get most of your work? Is it through referrals or through your relationships through academia? Not uh, through academia. Um, so let's see, there was a bunch of, that was a bunch of, kind of a bunch right, of, yeah. uh, that's okay. Um, let me think about this. So typical, well, the, 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 I was very lucky that one of the very big projects, like we were talking about, that the builder, who probably he was a very good builder, but he probably didn't know what poetic meant. Um, but my client for that really large project, which did, wasn't even thinking about anything contemporary or modern in expression, he wanted a, a Yellowstone um, lodge, basically. And when, we, when I first got the project, I was like, okay, fine, I can do this. But I didn't really understand it until I understood more about who he was. So this happened to be Stephen Covey. And he wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He was a Mormon. He had a ginormous family. Huh. And he had a PhD. And he was so smart and so alive. And so he really, the land was right outside Yellowstone National Park. 
And he being a Mormon with a huge family, knowing that family was going to continue to grow. When he said, I want a lodge, he really meant it because he, <laughs> he had a family that needed a lodge. Um, and he really, and, and all of them, they had a history with that landscape as a family because they'd been going for decades to that specific area for their kind of like summer and winter, I guess, vacations. So even though maybe, I don't know if I ever talked to him about poetics, I do remember I defended my PhD while I was working on that project. Um, but he got this idea of how do you make a place that is something that people are gonna revere, that are you know, gonna love and take care of and, and you know, that sort of thing. But moving closer into the type of work I do now, that came from two things and you hear this all the time and it is absolutely true. You design your own house or you design a house for a parent or a very close friend. And I had the opportunity to design a house in Paradise Valley for a close friend. And um, she actually had a background in architecture, but was now a photographer and now is a pretty well-known photographer. And so, she, you know, obviously I learned some things from her because she, she saw things as a photographer, um, how she, you know, how she envisioned, not necessarily spaces, but, as I would draw or work something, she, she would take a lens to it mm. to see kind of like what was actually going to be seen out the window and kind of like look at bracketing and things like that. And, and I, that, was, uh, that was really fascinating to me. And while I didn't have like carte blanche in the design, she, the kind of program that she said was, because it was out in the flat grasslands, so it's going to be seen. And she said, I want my house to look like a series of outbuildings on the Montana landscape and feel like a New York City loft on the inside. And I want it to be as green as I can afford. So it was a great, a great opportunity and a great challenge in that house has uh, really helped set the, you know, set my career. Um, and then shortly after that came the first house that I built with my past partner that was up in Cokedale. Um, and, you know, so that, that absolutely helps. Um, you know, during that time, like the web was just getting a start and print was still very strong. And because of my Harvard background, you know, you're, you're meeting all these people that you've read about in books and you're seeing their latest, you know, whatever and the newest, a lot of these journals don't exist anymore, but whether it was architecture or progressive architecture, and it becomes very clear to you that if you want a certain client and you want people to then understand your work in a certain context, you have to be published. Yeah. And I think that that still holds true in print. I mean, we, we have all of the things we can get to on Instagram, which, which I love, um, but I still think that that journals really give an opportunity to tell the story, your story of architecture in a, a more specific way, especially if you, if you have a good uh, person writing for you. Sure. Um, that's made a well, difference. Yeah, I'm happy that you mentioned that. It's, it's, it's something that, that comes up in these conversations as well. You know, how, how much, because it takes resources, you know, to kind of throw at the, the application process and right. you know it takes time to to create um, a stunning presentation uh, even to be considered for um, you know print, print publications uh, but here you know it's a, it's it's constant that we hear from our guests that it's it's a critical part of practice and it's worth it's worth that endeavor and and that time spent in order to to try and further your your work, further your your ideas, um, you know, and, and to maybe you were talking about kind of like maybe your watershed project with the client in the grasslands, but really setting the tone for what people are attracted to in your work, such that they're then of course going to come to you, uh -huh. you know, because of what they see in your work. Whereas, <clears throat> I mean. Having been in practice for 15 years, you know, I'm only just now getting out of a stage where I'm just a nice, a nice guy that's easy to work with kind of thing, that kind of referral, you know, like, oh, you know, we, we need an architect. Oh, you should, you know, call Sean. He's, but it, it's not really, 
you know, very, it, I'm only just now sort of getting to a place where people say, oh, I saw, your, you know, your work. Um, but, you know, it's like you I put a lot of energy into doing that. So I think um, it, it is important for, uh, you know, kind of our younger audience and, and people that are thinking about trying to go out on their own or just gone on, out on their own, that it is important to spend time trying to to get to get published. And even if it's, you know, smaller, smaller things, you know, it doesn't have to yeah. be a, a house, but uh, just just some endeavor that you might be uh, involved in. Um, and even the journal, like it doesn't have to be like the big national journals. Like, sure. you know, I've never been published in architecture and we haven't talked about that this, but I don't have a license. So I can't, I can't apply for the AIA awards. I can't, you know, they wouldn't really look at me for putting me in architecture or things like that. You know, neither does Nadir Tarani, but he has an office behind him where people are licensed. Um, so it's, it's a different, it's a different scenario. Um, so I think that, you know, it could be, especially Austin is so big, you know, where I am, it's still so small and, um, so it takes a different kind of, um, maybe effort in publication also because our audience is maybe most of them, uh, a lot of them are coming from out of state. And I know that Austin has obviously a lot of people moving through it, but, but there is great small magazines in Austin that would be an, a fantastic venue, you know, for a small project, for a, a guest house, a remodel, a whatever, that people look at and go, I kind of like that. Yeah. Um, because the audience is big enough there for, for um, just a small exposure, you know? Sure, sure. Well, kind of, you know, maybe on, on that same note, um, are, are there any, are, are there any sort of consultants, I'm saying consultant, but it, I don't know if that's exactly the right word, but are there any, any sort of uh, people that you have utilized that have really helped your practice in some way? I mean, I'm thinking about a bookkeeper. So this is a pretty, <laughs> this is a pretty dry, this is a pretty dry question. <laughs> but it's important because I, when I got a bookkeeper, it was like it was it was sort of life changing. Right. And, and I just didn't do it for the longest time because I just thought, well, that's just something as a small business owner. I, I'm just going to do that. Right. I can't I can't hire somebody. I don't I don't have the money to have like other people working on things for me. But it actually turned out to not be that expensive and, you know, was just kind of. I'm kicking myself now for not having done it earlier uh, because of how much money I've actually now saved through the process of having someone do, do that kind of side of the business for me. Oh, you're um, inspiring me, Sean. <laughs> well, I mean, it's really, it's been honestly yeah. incredible. Um, and I, I don't know if you've, I don't know if you've, you know, have any sort of like, Oh, always do this, or um, you know, this has been super helpful to to the business side of my practice, or uh, any any tips for people that are kind of struggling to just you know wear all the different hats that you have to wear, right? And that the the, the things that are mundane and they sort of distract you from the, the reason we all got into you know running our own firms in the first place. But it's 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 a part of our lives now, and it's it, it has to be done. Um, right. Well, I mean, I think that, uh, I think all of us have those struggles. What are those things that are going to help us and like release us from certain aspects? And, um, I was thinking about this earlier. I think that, um, architecture school does a really magnificent job of making everybody feel like they've got to be like the God of design or they're worth nothing. And um, while I practice by myself, I haven't always practiced by myself and I still collaborate with, with people, which I'll, I'll bring back up again in a second. Um, but I think that, that, you know, the first thing is being honest with yourself. What are you not, what are you not great at? And then how can you get help with that thing? And yeah. there are a lot, a lot of things I'm not great at. I think the thing that I'm strongest at is expressing a vision and designing. And um, until CAD came along, I was wicked fast with a pencil. Um, 
now I kind of struggle. I mean, I do a lot of CAD drawings. I'm not in a BIM program just because it's just too much for me. Yeah. Um, but but I, I think that obviously I don't have a bookkeeper, but I have an accountant. Thank sure. God. Yeah. Um, because I would just be, and I would just be lost and in the dark all and scared all the time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and you're right. Like those first, those first couple of bills, you're like, Oh my God. And then, and then you're like, yep, well, that's what it is. Um, but uh, I think in, in addition to that, um, I, and like I said, I don't have a bookkeeper, but I, I think that collaboratively, um, I like to work with repeat engineers and builders because what I do is still more unusual. It's not the convention, um, the details that I want to incorporate or how I am thinking about building something. And so having a kind of a repeating relationship, say with a structural engineer, have it, they understand like, that A, they're not gonna push you around. And, and B, like, and I haven't had an engineer try to push me around in a long time, but, but just this, like, she has, she has this vision, how do we make this happen? And, and then, you know, at the same time, not make it crazy expensive or, or be, you know, like, okay, that's gonna require a full steel moment frame, you know, and then immediately I go ding, ding, ding with the price and go, okay, so I need to rethink something. Um, so that, that's been really great and helpful. And man, my builders are like my best friends because if you, I don't mean that literally, but, sure, sure. but <laughs> if, if you don't have a good relationship with your builder, and there's not that sense of mutual respect. It is so got to be so agonizing. Um, and that's something I learned really early on. I worked in Portland, Oregon for like nine months, part of my internship. And I was working on banks and bank remodels and so far away from anything that I thought that I would do. But this, the builder that was in charge of this group of banks that I was helping, that I was doing the, the, the design, there was design work, but, you know, construction drawings, he was so uh, generous to me. Um, and so I'd go out for site meetings and it would be, you know, well, so you have this drawn and we found this condition. Would you like to do this or that? Not this plowing forward of we solved that problem for you and did something that you didn't want to do, but also really um, helping to educate me in, in that way of, um, and, and also what I should be expecting from builders in the future. So um, I don't know if that completely helps. I should also say that I, I collaborate with some of my past students. Yeah. Which is awesome. That's cool. Well, I know, yeah, I know a lot of, even when I was there, there would be a lot of, um, well, just a lot of peers that would kind of uh, go on to be maybe part of the, the Institute for a little while or the remote studio um, mm -hmm. as either, you know, participants or even maybe, maybe helping to kind of <laughs> educate and facilitate the, the programming. Um, I mean, it's great. I, I think it's wonderful that you bring up sort of the, the construction administration side of things. And I, I can, I can imagine sort of, you know, this, this, this push and pull between maybe creating interesting detailing out of stick framing, you know, it, it's going to be, you know, not conventional relative to maybe what the framers are used to, you know, mm -hmm. the way they normally build a header over a window, for example, um, and having to kind of, you know, guide both the builder and the framer through these details to say, look, I know this is not, not totally conventional, but it's also not vastly complex but either. Not crazy. <laughs> Right. Yeah, we, we just need to kind of have a conversation about how how it needs to go together. So with that, how much, you know, how much time do you spend uh, it, during during construction on site in construction administration for your own projects? Do you go there? And I know for you, it's you've got projects that are kind of in disparate portions of very large geographic locations. So uh -huh. probably not as easy for you to get in your car and, you know, drive right. over to East Austin and you know, check on it's your project. It's a little more planning, yeah. Sure, but yeah. but how how um, 
and maybe I, I, you know, I think about this a lot too. I've only had one contractor that's really utilized FaceTime well yeah. to, you know, just, Hey, I've got a question. Boom. This is what we're looking at. And uh, it's such an easy way to get, yeah, you know, a visual on what's happening when you can't be there physically. Uh, so I don't know if you've been able to use, you know, different technologies as they've evolved to help you be more involved in the construction mm -hmm. administration, given it might be a fairly remote, um, you know, lo location. But anyway, long winded question to just kind of understand sort of what portion if, if you look at, because I, I think one thing that's always difficult, I think probably everybody can agree to, with this. Um, you know, a lot of clients see a lot of hours in construction administration and they kind of balk at that, right? They, they say, well, you know, why, why would I need you beyond, you know, the construction documents because we're going to hire a builder and you have the drawings and it's just, it's always a difficult conversation to say, well, if you really want the vision that we've created together to come to fruition in the way that we both hope that it will, um, it's important for, for us to be um, as, as involved as you allow us to be. Um, I've yet to be on a project where I didn't go over my budgeted construction administration hours simply because there's value in me having it be done correctly, even if I'm not, you know, technically getting paid for it. Um, but I'm going to be much more disappointed if I just sort of throw my hands up and say, well, you know, it is what it is now. It's out of my hands. Uh, that that's sort of a worse position uh, as far as I'm concerned. Sure. So what kind of what portion of your sort of overall fee or scope of work do you feel falls into the construction administration side of things? That's a very interesting question. Um, so we have to accept that I practice more like an artist and less like a business person. And as I said in the beginning, that's one of the reasons like this idea of success is different for everybody. And while I would like to make more money and I still am kind of scratching my head going, okay, what, what can I tweak the next time? What, what, what didn't the clients value that I spent a lot of time at? Now that doesn't mean like I'm, if they said you're making models sucks and it's stupid and I wouldn't do that. I would still make them. I probably just wouldn't show them to them. Um, but, but I think that I, I don't, track there is another younger so a student who I'm collaborating with and we're almost the exact opposite he's got a bookkeeper he's got everything programmed he's got it he tracks every hour he also has employees um and you know it's I love listening to him talk about it because it's like oh yeah right and it doesn't mean that at some point I didn't work more like that but we didn't have all of the computer programs that could like you know, track all that stuff. So it was all still like, write it out by hand. Oh yeah, now you can put it in the computer and whatever. Um, but there weren't apps and programs. So um, I, what I learned, I have not had a client say to me in years, we don't need you to do CA work. I would probably box them. Um, so, uh, it just goes into the, into my contract. There's three parts, there's design, there's CDs and there is CA work. And, um, but what I have learned is my CA percentage is low. So that means I'm backing really what more of my CA hours into say the CD phase, okay. because nobody's going to really question you about that. Right. And then you just have to accept either if you're tracking your hours, you got to put that money aside, or if you're not, you know, then, you know, then it's, you are only getting a small amount monthly. Sure. Um, and then I try to be clear in my head of what is, germane to the actual um contract and the drawings and then what becomes a deviation that is additional services sure uh so that and it's a little scary to have to tell your client well you know you didn't that wasn't contracted for um and the only thing you can do is try that portion and and see but um so i i think about the ca where it's a little bit more like a fellowship fellowship 
<laughs> you know, there's a little bit of money I get every month, but I still need to go out and see those projects because if they screw it up, then I can't get it published. Mm, yeah. and that makes the difference on my next projects. And so it's an right. investment. Yeah, yeah. So you're just um, doing it for lunch, you're doing it for lunch money. But yeah, like lunch money, exactly. Um, but you're right that the technologies, especially uh, being able to send photographs back and forth and short texts and little videos and things, um, I've noticed in this last couple of years has really been a benefit. You know, you were talking about FaceTime. I'm like, you remember how remote Montana is? Like, yeah. I just, you know, sure. I had to go Wi-Fi out at my, at my house under construction because we can't get a cell signal you know, so that people can, we can communicate with each other. Sure. Um, but still, usually there, there's some way to, to, to do that. And the builder that I'm working with right now, the project that just um, broke ground, he's, I don't, I don't know which like building program it is that he's using, but he uploads everything onto the computer. So I'm seeing like a collection of photographs, like here's how excavation is, you know, or he'll come, Home at the end of the day and i'll send a picture with an email and you know it and we copy the engineer on it because they hit bedrock and they're like really do i still need to go eight feet underground you know <laughs> um and so i didn't even have to go out for that who photograph the engineers involved blamo there it is um but he's he's also been very um insistent that I stay involved like it's important to him he also wants to make sure that he has a good project that's executed he's sure. a great builder so it's not about building but like you say what are these details that maybe I haven't done before um yeah. those yeah. sorts of things cool well uh it's six minutes after one um okay. I, I want to be respectful to everyone's time here um are are there I, i'd like to open it up for questions if anyone uh, you know ha, has any questions for Lori, please feel free to chime in um and and speak up it's a quiet crew <laughs> okay well i'll take that as a as a as this has been so satisfying that i have no 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 stone was unturned uh, we could i'm sure we could talk for a couple more hours but um we really do appreciate you taking time uh out of your day Lori. good to see you thank you for the conversation um i think we we touched on some really important i love these types of conversations because i never really know where they're going i think probably if i was going to quickly reflect on this just the idea of the poetry um, and and hanging on to that, and I think it is something that tends to get kind of buried in the in the morass of of everything else that we have to keep you know in our brains at the same time as architects, especially trying to practice on your own and running a business and all of the different things. So I think it's it's always refreshing to sort of be able to recenter on you know the things that 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 quite frankly probably brought us into the profession mm -hmm. in the first place. Uh, in terms of our, you know, desired attraction to to, to this type of work, so uh, I, I really appreciate you bring, bringing that up. And um, good luck on finishing your own personal home. We'll look forward to maybe some more Instagram posts of of that as it wraps up. I kind of want to see the, the rain dripping off the back <laughs> and the green bathroom. Yeah. Um, and good luck on the new project that just broke broke ground. We'll look forward to getting updates on. On that. Yeah, I'll be. Uh, I'm looking forward to being able to post those once things actually start looking like something. <laughs> sure, sure. Understood. Okay. Well, uh, ha have a great afternoon and a great weekend. And say hi to Paradise Valley for me. I will. All right. Take care. Okay. Thanks for the opportunity. Bye bye. Bye.